Thanks, it's uh, great to be here. Um, I've had the privilege of working with a lot of very different leaders over the years, and it struck me that a lot of the lessons that I picked up from these very different leaders are things that we can all apply in our everyday lives. It also struck me that I've been to a lot of different talks by people on leadership, and the lessons are always very, very specific. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not running for president, uh, I don't run a Fortune 500 company, and I'm not planning to uh, start the next great revolution. Um, or I might be planning it, but I'm probably not doing it. Um, there are things that we all want to change in the world in many different ways, and they're often things we're doing through our businesses, uh, through our communities, in just the lives of our families and our friends and the people we care about. I think all those lessons on leadership are still things we can apply there. So what I've worked to do is really just to draw together a set of very common, simple, practical things that we can all apply, and which I think may be slightly counterintuitive than what you often hear in those leadership talks. The first thing is, we need to start by thinking, what is our actual view of the world? What is the world that we want to change? And what is the change we're truly trying to create? When I was at university, my favorite professor was actually from Bucharest. He was a professor of international relations at University College London. And he, like most folks here, had very little time for nonsense. Uh, if you tried to answer a question in his international relations class and you said, this policy is good because it creates security, he would stare you down and he'd say, who's security and for what purpose? That was always what he responded with, and people would always say, ah, this is great for security or for peace or for freedom, and he'd always stare them down and say, no, I don't know what you're talking about. You're gonna have to define that, who's security and for what purpose? And I'm gonna ask that same question when folks talk about changing the world. Whose world and for what purpose? By the way, I love that the default icon for the world, if you look it up on Google Image Search or wherever you're stealing graphics for your slide presentation, <laughs> not that I did that, all copyright free, per TED regulations. The default icon always has a picture of America as that primary image on the globe. And that's a perfect example, actually, of are you asking whose world and for what purpose? A lot of people would just say, ah, that's just a picture of the world. Doesn't really matter. They're generally the American graphic designers who stuck up that picture uh, onto Getty or wherever you're, you're nicking your images from. And that's a, an example of how you need to constantly question, is this the thing that will really resonate with everyone else? Another image, continuing with the cartographical theme, is this picture of the, the world. Now, this is, this is a map of the world that you are probably all incredibly familiar with. Now, this is what is known as a Mercator map projection. It was created by a Flemish cartographer, Gerardus Mercator, in 1569. This is the standard map of the world that you'll find in most classrooms, most boardrooms around the world. Um, and it was designed for sailors in Europe at the time, and it, it does something quite complicated. It turns a 3D globe into a rectangular image of the world, which it turns out is actually really hard to do in a way that doesn't distort the image entirely. And Mercator tried to do the best for the purposes that he was creating that map for. And he created a map that accurately presents the shape of the countries and the territories on this, but it completely distorts the size of those images, especially as you get further away from the equator. Here's another entirely different view of the world. That's the Peters projection. That was created by a German academic, Arno Peters, uh, back in the 1970s. And this one takes a completely different approach, recognizing that if you I'll just go back to that previous slide. If you look at that Mercator image, look how massive Greenland looks, for example. It looks like it takes up like half the world. There's Greenland all over again. It turns out that in reality, Greenland is actually roughly the size of Mexico. And what the Peters projection does is it accurately presents the size of different parts of that world relative to each other. There are things that are not entirely accurate about it because it turns out with any map, when you're projecting that 3D globe onto a rectangular image, there are challenges. But it's something that is slightly more representative of the actual world that we all live in. 
I think all of us need to be asking that same question of ourselves as we think about the change that we're trying to create. Are we looking at the world as it actually is? Or are we using a completely distorted image of the things that we really want to create? And it's just inevitable that all of us, as the product of the environments we grew up in, uh, end up thinking that the way things are in our lives is something that is much more representative than it really is. If you want to create real valuable change for a lot of people, though, you have to look beyond those perspectives and you have to think about the world as it actually is. And I'll give you a very practical example of what it means when you don't do that. You end up creating apps and services or inventions or hypothesizing about inventions, which you think are a much bigger deal than they really are. Is blockchain really the biggest thing ever? Are self-driving cars really the most exciting thing in the world? Or is it the fact that more than half the world goes to bed hungry every single night? Is it the fact that billions of people around the world still don't have access to things like electricity or clean running water? There's a completely different world out there, and before we go and change it, we have to know what it actually looks like. My next lesson is around what I call the paperclip game. And this is something that I first started thinking about years ago when a amazing Canadian blogger, Kyle McDonald, managed to trade a single paperclip for a house. He took a paperclip and he posted online on a forum. He said, I really want to try and get all the way to a house, so I'll trade you this paperclip for something slightly bigger. Can someone help me out on this? So he went and swapped his paperclip for, I think it was a pen, and he kept trading up. At some point, somebody offered him uh, a recording contract in the music studio. He swapped that. He ended up getting a part in a TV show. He swapped that. He ended up owning a farm. So when I think about creating change, a lot of the time, we go straight to the biggest things we want to do. You want to end war. You want to stop climate change and build a net zero carbon economy. You want to bring peace to the country or to the world. Those are all perfectly laudable and fantastic goals to have, but they're massive. They're impossible to achieve on their own. And yeah, you'll absolutely inspire people to come and be part of that journey with you, but the first thing that will happen is they say, well, what actually comes next? To have any valuable change, to go on any valuable journey, you need to break it down. You need to start with the paperclip. And yes, you can aim for those big things. You can one day get to those massive, massive goals and outcomes, but you will probably have a lot of trading to do before you get there. And if you start with that paperclip, you'll be on a very, very practical journey. And by the way, that's exactly how it is at massive companies and services like Facebook and Google. Every day, they're working to connect the world. But really what that means is they're focused on very small, incremental, completely unglamorous things on a daily basis. You might be optimizing an algorithm by one or two percent. You might be trying to make a few people a little bit happier in the way they use a certain product. All those things together create that massive change. You also need to start by thinking, what is the actual change that I want to create, not what everyone else wants you to do? And this is a picture of Henry Ford. Uh, Henry Ford had this famous saying. He said, if I'd asked my customers what they would have wanted, they would have asked for a faster horse. <laughs> he went and built this instead. This is the Ford Quadricycle in the 1890s. This was his motor car, which started off the Ford Empire. And it's because he believed in that. It was something that he was passionate about. It was something he invented. How many people in the world are looking to create a change but are really trying to invent faster horses? The number of times I go and meet entrepreneurs and change makers and they say, I really want to create a business, Dex. How do I go about coming up with an idea for my business? And that's completely the wrong approach. You want to start by saying, this is the thing I actually want to do in the world. This is the problem I'm trying to solve for people. This is the value I'm trying to create. And that might be something which becomes a very valuable business. In fact, that's how valuable businesses get started, by having that idea, by having that problem you're trying to solve. But if you simply go around asking people, what's the way I can make you happy? They're probably going to give you an answer that's completely rooted in stuff that's already been done before, because the future hasn't been invented yet. 
Start by choosing the things that you really want to do and understanding what is the real problem that you're trying to solve. If you want to create change, you also need to think about who is going to create change with you. There's this uh, famous saying, if you want to go fast, go alone. And if you want to go far, you go together. And this is a picture uh, which one of my friends took at an event that I organized in San Francisco a couple of years ago. This was a, uh, a large rally uh, just after uh, Donald Trump had been inaugurated as the president. And this was a rally in solidarity with refugees and immigrants. Now, in 2016, after the election, I left my job working for Elon Musk uh, very soon after the election. And I had this moment of epiphany. It was a couple of days after the election, and I was walking inside the rocket factory in Los Angeles, and I was waiting for a journalist. I was supposed to take them around to look at the different rockets. And I realized that I wouldn't be able to keep doing this job with a straight face in the next year. Because every day I went to work and I thought about how to tell a story about humanity's far-flung future, a future on other worlds and how to make an interplanetary species possible. And how was it possible to go and do that when our future is under attack right now? When a common humanity and solidarity is being attacked by political leaders in the world? So I went and I instead spent the next year and a half focused on social change projects. And naturally, when I went and did that, I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. The world is huge, these problems are massive, I'm trying to work my way through them. And I ended up posting on Facebook, asking if there was anybody who wanted to help me with this. Within just the space of a few days, hundreds of people had said, yeah, I'd like to be involved. And this rally in San Francisco, which had about 10,000 people on the streets, that was organized in six days with four strangers who I'd never met before, who were all students. And that, for me, was an incredibly powerful example of you can try and think your way through a problem all on your own, or you can ask for help and go together with people, and that's when things get really, really interesting. There are so many people trying to create change who think they're the heroic, solitary inventor or genius or revolutionary in their office or their garage or late at night working by the light of a lamp. And that's all really romantic and fantastic, but that's not actually how change genuinely takes place. Every invention is created by a lot of different mothers and fathers. You also need to think about communications as something completely integrated with what you're trying to create in the world. There are so many times folks tell me, ah, this invention, it speaks for itself. The product speaks for itself. I don't need some fancy spin doctor or PR guy to go and tell my story. I'm busy working on creating the next great thing. And that's completely fantastic, except communications absolutely is something that will depend uh, on whether your product will go out and succeed in the world. You can't just create something and assume that everyone just gets it. Um, and there are so many examples throughout history of folks who have not succeeded at that. Tesla, one of the most famous inventors in history, uh, the Serbian-American inventor, popularized, celebrated his name behind one of Elon's companies today. The reason why Tesla's a hero in Silicon Valley and why his name is on that company is because he was a guy who was a brilliant inventor but terrible at communications. And Silicon Valley uses him as an instructive story today of what happens when you're a brilliant mind but you don't know how to sell your product to the public or translate it into value that people understand. And that's why Tesla ended up actually dying in relative obscurity and poverty, while other folks like Thomas Edison, who were fantastically successful and celebrated as inventing things, even when they weren't just as great minds. And the way I think about communications for change in the world is you want to have a revolutionary component to it. Revolutionaries are folks who are entirely about communications. They recognize that political change isn't just the process in the back room, working with elites and working with processes and systems. It's something that depends on a message. And that message is something that has to be transformative. It's something that has to be inevitable. It's something that you feel is going to happen anyway. You're just speeding things up. It has to be something that's believable. You're not just saying, I'm going to change the world. You're actually doing something people will trust you can actually achieve. And it's got to be simple enough that people will actually be able to understand you rather than just talking in scientific jargon. So think about communications as part of that process of change. Don't just think this is the job for some PR person later on. 
you want to be able to communicate your inventions from the very start to a lot of different people. On data, this is a poster that adorns the walls of many Silicon Valley companies. Data wins arguments. It's a powerful mantra in Silicon Valley. It is completely wrong. I have had so many arguments with colleagues and friends over the years about the validity of this statement. Data doesn't win arguments. It turns out that humans win arguments. And yeah, humans should use more data. When you have a conversation, sometimes they're entirely fact-free. You want to have some data to go behind that. But humans ultimately are emotional creatures. We're not fully rational all the time. We choose things that are ridiculous on a frequent basis. Data is a human invention, and it is subject to the same flaws and biases as all humans. And that's why there's plenty of examples in the valley and throughout industry of when data makes people make really bad decisions. There was a metric used for a long time in Silicon Valley about time spent on apps and services. The more time you spent on an app, the more successful it was supposed to be. Well, actually, it turns out that if people just spend a lot of time on their phones or in their apps, they might feel terrible afterwards. Um, and actually, the way people feel about a service, the sentiment, actually turns out to be a much more valuable indicator of is that product actually performing well and creating value in our lives. Um, plenty of other examples of facial recognition systems which don't recognize people from certain ethnic groups. Uh, voice recognition systems like uh, on certain uh, assistants like Alexa, where it turns out you have to put on your best fake American accent to make them work. That's what happens when you just rely on the flawless power of data. Don't do that. Put it in a human context. Recognize the ethical and social framework in which decisions should be made. Data is really, really powerful, but it won't solve all your problems on its own. Great leaders know when to quit. It's important to know when to show up. It's important to know when to dig in. But it's also important to know when to surrender and when it's time to get off the stage, which I'll be doing in just a couple of minutes, according to this clock. <laughs> there are so many great leaders I've met throughout my life who feel that they have to suffer for what they believe in. I don't really like my job. I don't really like my organization. I have to keep doing it because everyone will make fun of me and I'll be embarrassed horribly if I quit. They'll all judge me. Trust me, nobody is doing that because everyone else is worrying about everyone else judging them. <laughs> much more valuable is to think, I can create as much change as possible here, but when it's time to go, I'll take that change and create it somewhere else. Every moment that you spend wasting it on things that aren't truly valuable and making use of your talents, that is a time you are taking away from the real thing that you could be doing. So know when it's time to go and do that. Real leaders don't try to divide people to succeed. This is an image from War of the Worlds, H.G. Wells' science fiction story from the 1800s. He wrote about a war between uh, aliens and Earth because he thought that if there was an alien invasion, humanity would unite and we'd all suddenly enter a new realm of peace and prosperity because we would be working together against that. Well, actually, that didn't happen, and lots of leaders still keep trying to get that alien invasion moment. They try to divide us against different people in order to uh, motivate people. It is an incredibly unproductive method because it turns out people don't always like to be at war and to be in endless conflict with each other. Much better is to unite people and find ways to bring us together rather than just manufacturing enemies. Wrapping up now, this is a photo taken in a bar in San Francisco. It's a model of a clock that's being built in the Texas desert by an organization called the Long Now Foundation. This is a clock called the 10,000-year clock. It's designed to tick once every century uh, the cuckoo in the clock only sounds once every millennium. It's designed to make people think about the future, because it turns out the future lasts forever. You may think that sounds ridiculous, but for most of us, it doesn't. Companies are driven by really short-term incentives. The future might just last a quarter if you're a business executive. If you're a politician, it lasts as long as you need before you need to run for re-election. And all of us, we might just need to get through our day. Social media influences, the future lasts as long as your next Instagram post is getting likes. We need to think about the long-term consequence of what we want to create, not just the here and now. And that's really, really important and hard to do in today's world. And lastly, changing the world is not just about going out there and changing everything everyone else is doing. You've got to start with yourself. And the number one thing I've learned from every leader I've worked with is that most people aren't good at doing most things most of the time. And the best leaders know that we're all pretty terrible at most things. We can't be good at everything. You can be really good at a narrow range of things, but you need to ask for help. And that's why you always need to be working to improve yourself. 
So before you go out and change the world, start by thinking, what do I need to change in my own life? And you will be that much more effective, and you really will go and change the world. Thank you.